Yeah. Uh, uh, it was we really need to have the feedback problem fixed. Yeah. Was this a feedback problem? Yeah. Thank you. This is a page test, I think. <laughs> oh, well, that's better. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so he, he wondered it, how, how he would know that it was um, uh, authentic, and a, or uh, how he would know it was not a mistake. And so, after he he left uh, the Air Force, he went and got a PhD in operations research, and his and his uh, thesis became the book Strategic Command and Control: Redefining the Nuclear Threat, which really did redefine. Uh, are thinking about control of nuclear weapons. Uh, he was at the Brookings Institution as a senior fellow for many years, where he also wrote a book called The Logic of Accidental Nuclear War, continuing this, this concern. Uh, and then he went off and founded his own uh, World Security Institute, and then co-founded the uh, Global Zero Movement uh, to, to uh, uh, for nuclear disarmament. Most recently, uh, he wrote and, and got many uh, senior former nuclear commanders and defense ministers uh, to, to endorse uh, a the Global Zero Commission on Nuclear Risk Reduction. So uh, he's, he's uh, currently a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's International Security Advisory Board, and he's also, I'm happy to say, a member for the research faculty of the Google Wilson School Program on Science and Global Security, and is the title of his talk is Reducing the Risks of Nuclear Weapons Use. Thank you. Well, I'm really um, fortunate to have two of the world's leading nuclear weapons experts here backing me up this afternoon. Frank uh, being one of them, the other being uh, Hans Blix, uh, Swedish foreign minister, and famously the head of the, uh, the uh, search committee looking for the non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq prior to the Iraq invasion. Those are the hardest ones to find, aren't they? <laughs> uh, so um, I'm very, very pleased to be able to present here today. Thank you for coming, for listening. Um, as you might have gathered from Frank's introduction, I'm going to be doing a little reminiscing um, at, in, in my talk because my interest in this topic of nuclear risk is not only uh, professional, but it's uh, also personal. Uh, ever, since, ever since I figured out how to circumvent the safeguards on the nuclear tip missiles under my control in the 1970s. Uh, I and one other young officer in his early uh, 20s at that time could have illicitly fired up to 50 intercontinental ro rockets aimed at uh, the Soviet Union in, in China. We could have single-handedly destroyed their major cities uh, with the explosive firepower roughly equivalent to 4,000 Hiroshima bombs. We could actually have done much worse by sending a launch order with valid codes to other units of the strategic forces whose standing rule was to accept and execute any order that contained valid launch codes regardless of its source. source. So if a little birdie flew into the launch center um, with a band around its neck containing codes that validated against codes in the safe, you were under strict orders to proceed to launch your forces. Uh, don't worry, these, uh, these small deficiencies were later corrected. In fact, uh, that was done in 1977 when uh, those missiles were locked up electromechanically. And to fire them, one needed to receive a code that enabled the crew to unlock the missile prior to firing. And that code was held uh, only at higher levels in the chain of command and would be released only in the event of, of war. Um, I, <clears throat> this anecdote uh, I mentioned for a reason, and that's that it illustrates how safeguards over the last, well, during the, the course of the Cold War, um, became more stringent over time. 
early in the Cold War, the top priority was to ensure that nukes could, could always be used when directed. Ensuring that they could never be used except when directed was a secondary priority. It's a balance between always and never, and uh, that balance over time trended towards never in all of the major categories of risk. Um, however, significant risks remain in the U.S. system and ever uh, even greater and growing risks remain in the postures of the other eight nuclear countries possessing uh, weapons. Risks of unauthorized launches, of accidental detonations, of mistaken launch on false warning, um, of crisis escalation that results in the deliberate or the inadvertent uh, release of nuclear weapons and of weapons falling into the hands of terrorists through capture, or theft, or possibly uh, purchase. So my goal in this seminar is to highlight the trend lines of these basic categories of risks uh, of use among uh, all the nine countries and to identify a few low-hanging fruit remedies that I think uh, would help reduce those risks. I obviously uh, have to skim a lot of material because it's a huge, uh, it's a huge task at hand. Uh, and I want to begin by saying that there are clearly big gaps in our knowledge, including in the American system, which is by far the most uh, transparent. Uh, we discover new worrying deficiencies in the U.S. system all the time. Uh, partly this reflects the emergence of new threats to command and control, like cyber warfare, uh, the impact of which we haven't even begun to understand and analyze. Often it just reflects uh, problems, discoveries of previously overlooked deficiencies. And I, again, will uh, 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 mention my own experience here in the mid-1990s when I advised a commission looking into possible scenarios involving the unauthorized use of U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, scores of scenarios were discovered. Scores. One involved uh, an electronic backdoor into the Naval <coughs> Communications Network. This early discovery uh, anticipated the current concern with cyber intrusion into these networks. It also uh, identified a serious, serious deficiency in Trident ballistic missile submarine uh, safeguards and led to the inst installation of a major, major new safeguard in 1997. These were all old problems that only surfaced through independent review, and this happens time and time again. We never quite get to the bottom of these things. So these gaps and uncertainties uh, make it hard for any of the nine countries with nuclear weapons to defend the claim that their deterrent value outweighs the myriad risks of their use. Simply don't have a solid assessment on the risks. Don't necessarily have a solid assessment on the uh, impact of deterrence either. But I would further argue that the risks are far greater than commonly believed. They are growing in some areas, and remedies, uh, remedies are urgently needed. Uh, so the bottom line is that none of uh, the nine nuke nations are anywhere close to never, to, to zero risk. All of them prepare for war, for ensuring that their nuclear weapons can always be used and called upon, and in preparing for this war, they risk causing it in one fashion or another. So let me begin with the United States and Russia and leave some of the uh, situa situations in other countries into the story. Um, but the underlying cause of quite a few of the problems in the U.S.-Russia case stems from the vulnerability of their uh, nuclear chains of command. Frank mentioned that I uh, worked hard on, on this issue at Brookings and published the book Strategic Command and Control in the, uh, in the uh, mid-80s, which tried to prove this point, that a few tens of weapons could decapitate their nuclear leadership, and some of the communications links used to transmit the GO code to the submarines, the bombers, and the land-based missile forces. So the two sides tried to work around this acute vulnerability, and they did so in ways that uh, were risky. And uh, what they did, these risky things, 
casts a long shadow on the present situation. First, um, throughout the entire Cold War, all U.S. presidents pre-delegated their nuclear launch authority to multiple military commanders, all of whom acquired all of the authorization and unlocking codes needed to execute a full-scale strategic strike. And we're talking upwards of, of about 12 senior military commanders here and, and their deputies. And it's very easy to imagine, and I could sketch it out for you, scenarios in which communications uh, outages of even short duration would have resulted in an abrupt and irretrievable assumption of launch authority by one or more of these generals. That was that spanned the Cold War. It was rolled back at the end of the Cold War, but it remains alive in organizational culture, and all the essential codes remain widely distributed in the military chain of command. The Soviets didn't do this. They distrusted their military, and they absolutely eschewed pre-delegation. So their approach was to impose highly centralized, top-down control, core political, a core value of their political culture going back to the czars. They invested huge sums in building underground and other command posts to protect their leaders. They infiltrated KGB and political officers into the nuclear chain of command from top to bottom. They installed sophisticated locks on all of their strategic, not, not strategic, but strategic weapons at an early stage of the Cold War. And they held the unlocking codes um, for, the, uh, for those weapons at the highest levels. And finally, they directly linked the top level command posts to the missile launch equipment in the field so that they could bypass all humans down the chain of command. They even went so far as to build an elaborate launch apparatus, uh, really akin to the doomsday mach machine in Dr. Strangelove, uh, in order to ensure semi-automatic nuclear retaliation in the events of a U.S. strike that decapitated their top leadership. Uh, an impressive set of safeguards, but as the Moscow coup of 91 demonstrated, when a country's social and political contract collapses, it brings down with it virtually the entire edifice of safeguards. And in this case, the coup plotters, including the head of the KGB and the defense minister and others who often were inebriated and certainly were exhausted most of the time, simply seized the reins of uh, nuclear forces from Gorbachev. And safeguards were severely compromised as a result. A few years later, an alcoholic by the name of Yeltsin had his finger on the button. So uh, the, the standard assumption in the deterrence paradigm of rational actors at the apex of nuclear command at all times simply really doesn't hold up too well. And that's true even in the U.S. case. Um, I was on alert in a launch bunker during the 73 Arab uh, Israeli war when an order came down directing us to move to the next higher state of nuclear war. Retrieve our launch keys and launch codes from our safe and strap into our chair to brace for imminent nuclear explosions. Uh, Nixon was the president at the time, but he was not in charge that night. He had retired to his quarters, uh, to his quarters reportedly um, inebriated before Henry Kissinger and others ordered this nuclear order. In contrast to the Soviet penchant for locking up their strategic nukes, the U.S. delayed introducing locking devices requiring input from higher authority to fire the forces. The individual commanders possessed the technical ability to fire their weapons throughout most or all of the Cold War. Uh, bomber crews until 1970, uh, 1970, land missile crews until 1977, and 1997 for submarine crews. These devices uh, still are far from uh, foolproof. By the 70s and 80s, both sides also adopted an accident-prone tactic known as launch on warning in order to ensure that their strategic forces could be fired before incoming weapons arrived. Now, 
Uh, the flight time of incoming weapons is 12 to 30 minutes. Uh, so nuclear decision making on both sides became extremely rushed, um, emotionally charged, and yet pro forma, uh, because of the, the uh, potential for panic, pro forma driven by checklists. I describe it as a rote enactment of a prepared script. In some scenarios of, under launch on warning, uh, after only a three minute assessment of early warning data, the U.S. President receives a 30 second briefing on his nuclear response options and their consequences. And then he has a few minutes at, at the very most 12 under launch on warning to choose one of these. Then a short launch order would be transmitted to the launch crews. Uh, how short? That's the length of the tweet. And then the crews transmit a short stream of computer signals that immediately ignite the rocket engines of many hundreds of land-based missiles. For the U.S., this took when I served and still takes today one minute. I personally practiced this hundreds of times. We were called Minutemen. The U.S. submarine crews can fire their missiles in 12 minutes. <coughs> Our heavy reliance on launch on warning means that, again, we have a problem with the standard paradigm of stable mutual deterrence, which is uh, supposed to rest on second strike retaliation after absorbing a massive attack. This was clearly an intellectual construct without operational meaning. And a former four-star commander of the Strategic Air Command explains this. I'd like just to read it. It's a short quote. quote our policy was premised on being able to accept the first wave of attacks. Yet at the operational level, it was never accepted. They, the, the nuclear planners in Omaha, built a construct that powerfully biased the president's decision process toward launch before the arrival of the first enemy warhead. A movement practice to a system structured to drive the president invariably toward a decision to launch under attack. So in line with this shift to launch on warning, nuclear planners rigged the war plan to make launch on warning or preemption, first strike, absolutely essential to achieving the war aims of the plan. They effectively stripped presidents of any ability to write out an attack before deciding how to respond. They also rigged the plan to ensure that the entire enemy target base, including cities, would be destroyed in the first salvo, even if presidents tried to spare cities. And throughout the Cold War, they did not allow any civil civilians to inspect the president's nuclear briefcase carried by his military aid. Um, the civilians, officials were, officials were unable to ensure that the president's emergency response options in that briefcase conform to the nuclear employment guidance that he, the president, issued in peacetime. <coughs> Presidents never complained. They, they went along. They, they reluctantly acquiesced to this imperative of making a quick decision to fire on warning. Reagan, in his memoirs, lamented, quote, six minutes to decide uh, how to respond to a blip on a radar scope and decide whether to release Armageddon, exclamation point, end quote. Although admitting uh, that it was an accident-prone policy, top advisors to presidents, such as Henry Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft, argued, in this case in a top secret meeting of the NSC, that, quote, it is not to our disadvantage if we appear irrational to the Soviets in this regard, end quote. Uh, well, uh, this irrational posture remains intact today. Our nuclear command system and forces practice it several times a week, and so do the Russians. And believe it or not, Russia shortened the launch time even more. Uh, today, top military command posts in the, in the Moscow area, like the headquarters of the general staff, can directly fire by remote control rockets in silos and on trucks, as far away as Siberia in only 20 seconds. Now, you know, common sense would tell 
most of us, this is a little on the risky side. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, Europe, the U.S. early warning situation today. Each day, our teams in the early warning center out in Colorado receive indications that require them to urgently assess whether we're under attack or whether the indications are, are not threatening or, or the alarm is false. Once or twice a week, they have to take a second close look. And every now and then, all hell breaks loose. Uh, and the indications look real enough to bring them to the very brink of the system to bring the punch on the way. The United States and Russia come this close on uh, two or three, maybe four occasions each during the course of the Cold War. I mentioned one of them, an occasion uh, involving Zbigniew Brzezinski, his national security advisor, who was awakened and told twice that the United States was under full-scale Soviet nuclear attack. And he was just seconds away from picking up the phone to, uh, in the middle of the night, to ask or instruct President Carter that we were under attack and that uh, uh, he, Carter, would have to choose a re retaliatory option without delay. Um, in the context of deteriorating relations that produce a crisis between them in the future, uh, the, the risk of a mistaken launch may, may be even higher. Uh, because of the decrepit state of the Russian nuclear early warning system. Russia's completely lost its space-based early warning uh, segment, relies on ground ra radar, and its decision timeline for launch on warning today has decreased to two to four minutes. Uh, now, during a crisis, the pendulum swings back toward always, and the predisposition of leaders to believe missile attack warning uh, would, uh, I would argue, uh, I think it's logical, would be heightened. And I've shown using Bayesian statistics in the second book, Logic of Accidental Nuclear Reward, that a predisposed mind would rationally become convinced of an attack after only one or two cycles of positive attack indications from early warning sensors. Positive meaning that they say we're under attack, not that that is truly true. Um, this, is a, this, this posture is a mistaken launch waiting to happen during a crisis. And it's a risk that's increasingly relevant to other countries, which are actually beginning to follow in the footsteps of the United States and Russia in diversifying and dispersing and forward deploying nuclear forces on ever higher states of alert. So now I'd like to kind of run down the highlights of all those other countries and identify some of the areas that I think are uh, especially interesting from the standpoint of nuclear risk. Starting with China, which for 50 years was an absolute model of nuclear restraint, it still is in many respects. Al almost all of China's nuclear weapons sit at a single storage facility, <coughs> I thought. Transportation and uploading of these weapons would take days to weeks to months. Control over them is highly centralized and reinforced by modern safeguards. And so in peacetime, China runs minimal risks in all of these dimensions that I've been discussing. Uh, but this restraint appears to be on its way out. Uh, the second artillery, which runs China's nuclear forces, wants to put forces on higher alert and send them out on patrol, on land and sea, armed with nuclear warheads. And China is also developing an early warning satellite network that could support an option of launch on warning. And the second artillery wants President Xi Jinping to be equipped with a nuclear suitcase in order to expedite launch authorization in an emergency. India, like China, shifting its priority from never to always. Like China in peacetime, its nuclear forces are completely off alert today. All the, all the warheads are kept disassembled under the custody of non-military departments. And like China, it would take days to weeks to make them to delivery vehicles in the field. India's goal is that in a crisis, once they are deployed and put on alert, however, it aims to have them in a posture to be able to fire them within 30 minutes after transmitting the order to those forces. 
Uh, India is also going to increase its day-to-day -day readiness. Its uh, nuclear establishment is pressing hard for India to prepare its weapons and its command uh, system for rapid operations in peacetime as well as in crisis and wartime. And Prime Minister Modi has been thus equipped with a nuclear suitcase uh, linked to dedicated communications circuits in order to expedite launch authorization. These are major shifts, in my view, in China and India, away from never toward always. Now I turn to Pakistan, which is uh, uh, even more worrisome. It's the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world and may soon overtake China um, and, and for third place before long in a decade or so. Although it also currently keeps its nuclear weapons disassembled in peacetime, it's moving steadily toward a posture requiring early dispersal and early first use of tactical nuclear weapons under more and more decentralized control during a crisis, crisis with India in particular. Uh, there are also indications of jihadist sympathies within the military. With possible help from insiders, the terrorists capture and use of weapons inside India, or Pakistan itself is a, a real threat to South Asian security today. And the social fabric of the Pakistani state is in somewhat of tatters. If it disintegrates someday, safeguards against nuclear weapons falling into the hands of terrorists would collapse. North Korea, it's weaponizing. It's uh, reportedly making headway in miniaturizing nuclear warheads to fit atop its missiles, but already um, North Korea has missiles that uh, have ample space in their nose cones to carry crude fission devices as far away as Japan. And if and when this arming occurs, uh, with an unpredictable leader's finger on the button, Kim Jong-un, uh, one could imagine that a nuclear disaster will be waiting to happen in Northeast Asia. UK and France, they just not doing anything. Both keep a single submarine on low-level alert at sea at all times. Uh, let me end with Israel, whose nuclear status is so opaque that it's very difficult to say very much credibly, reliably, but it does appear to be acquiring, acquiring the capability to project nuclear threats on shorter notice than, in, than it has in the past. Uh, its cur current arsenal appears to be on a low level of alert in peacetime, but it is reportedly deploying into the Persian Gulf strategic submarines capable of launching nuclear cruise missiles. So depending on evolving threats in the region, um, uh, obviously Israel's keeping a particular eye on Iran's. Uh, Israel may begin to establish regular nuclear armed sea patrols in the future. Now, shifting a little bit into kind of accidents, pure accidents, primarily. And I would note that, that most of these newer nuclear weapons countries appear to be decades behind the United States in terms of the safety and safeguards of, of, in their weapons, of their weapons. Lagging in areas like one-point safety, fire-resistant plutonium pits, insensitive high explosion, explosives, and sophisticated modern locking devices. I remember the United States in the growing pain years of the, of the Cold War uh, suffered over a thousand serious incidents with its nuclear weapons and uh, quite a number of crashes that came very close to, um, to nuclear detonations, including some on American territory. Um, and since then, we've come a very long way in, uh, toward the never end of the spectrum by designing and by extensively testing our nuclear weapons uh, with these safety features that I just mentioned. But the other countries have them. They're nowhere close. They have a less advanced safety culture, far fewer resources, few, very few tests under the belt. In some cases, just one or two or three. Um, and they lack the technological sophistication of the United States. And as a consequence, they uh, are going to run even higher risks of accidents and detonations during their growing pain years. And these risks will only grow as they increase the readiness and tempo, operational tempo of their weapons as they are doing today. 
Um, nor, nor, I mean, this isn't to suggest that we can uh, rest on our laurels. Many of you have probably heard the story of the six nuclear cruise missiles that were inadvertently loaded onto a U.S. bomber in 2007 and flown across the country. No one knew the payload was nuclear. No one uh, knew that nukes went missing at the home base. Um, and no one guarded them for, for over a day. More recently, we learned that our launch officers, the young folks sitting in the hole like I used to do, are violating nuclear weapons safety rules intentionally. They have, in some cases, compromised the launch codes. And they basically have low morale and, and, and are ethically challenged um, in many of the things that they're doing. A recent, uh, a recent report that was dug up through Freedom of Information uh, Act revealed that between 2009 and 13, there were nearly 1,500 incidents involving Air Force nuclear weapons alone, just the Air Force. Russia's can't be left off the hook. Its risks are very complex and severe. Just three years ago, a Russian submarine with a full complement of nuclear-armed missiles caught fire in Drydock. Russia has far more nukes in transit at any time than any other country, and transportation is the Achilles heel of security. Nuclear uh, material security there is subpar. There's a black market for this material, and dozens of cases of weapon, weapons grade of smuggling have surfaced, surfaced. And finally, with 2,000 Russian Chechens fighting in Syria for ISIL, Russia faces a growing threat of terrorism, perhaps uh, a greater threat of nuclear terrorism as fighters return. Now, change of subject to cyber warfare. Um, it's a new factor in the risk equation concerned that it could um, uh, be used to infiltrate nuclear command control communications and early warning networks. Could those data, early warning data, be corrupted? Uh, could someone actually hack into the launch circuits? Questions um, are, are abound, are too many to, to mention, uh, but the questions that come to mind could state or non-state actors, unauthorized actors, spoof early warning networks into reporting spurious indications that trigger a mistaken launch? Could hackers breach the firewalls, the air gaps, and transmit the launch orders to the crews themselves or even to the weapons directly? And what if an insider colluded with outsiders to provide access and passwords to the launch circuits? Now, contrary <coughs> to popular belief, uh, nuclear networks simply are not hermetically sealed, no matter what anyone says. I mentioned earlier the discovery of this electronic backdoor that offered outsiders a chance to get inside the U.S. Naval Broadcast Network. They could have actually seized and operated the main radio station used to transmit launch orders to Trident submarines in the Atlantic. The Navy took this threat so seriously that they completely revamped the procedures for validating launch orders so that in future, an order received out of the blue in peacetime would not be accepted as valid unless and until it was verified by a second independent source. Another example of jumping the air gas potentially. In 2010, a few years ago, underground missile launch crews lost total contact with a huge field of uh, missiles in Wyoming, Minuteman missiles. Soon after the contact was lost, um, the supposedly firewall control network for them was automatically opened uh, because of a procedure that has, has been uh, put in place to hedge against the possibility of a strike against the underground launch control centers. That procedure is that a timer expires and activates a radio antenna in each of the missile silos in order for those silos, without people involved in those silos, silos to receive signals from airborne launch control centers, the backup centers. Now, so when that happened, this gave outsiders a potential pathway for injecting the three short computer signals needed to fire the <coughs> missiles, a target, an arm, and a fire command. Now, now, we just don't understand um, 
the vulnerability of our nuclear forces to this threat. I can tell you it has not been thoroughly uh, studied. President Obama has taken a very personal interest in this issue and was very upset about what happened in 2010. Um, but the bottom line to me is that in light of our poor understanding of the threat, it just seems imprudent in the extreme to keep U.S. and Russian nuclear missiles ready to fly uh, on hair trigger alert as soon as they receive a short stream of computer signals. It's that simple. I'll, I'd like to wind down now with uh, just a brief discussion of the problem of crisis escalation resulting from brinksmanship and inadvertence in here. I'm uh, stepping into the arena of my distinguished colleagues from the Woodrow Wilson School. John I can very um, So weigh in, straighten me out if you want, but here's what I have to say. So preventing the use of nukes in a crisis is supposed to be the, the job of a psychological construct called deterrence. Everyone knows about it. But in a crisis, deterrence morphs into an extreme sport or can very easily. A game of taking and manipulating existential risk morphing into games of chicken, of bluff, of coercion, and of blackmail. And the basic idea here is to get the other side to back down by inst inst instilling fear in the other side that things are getting out of control, and that we may s events may spin into uh, and out of control to the threshold of the use of nuclear weapons. So uh, in a crisis, nuclear risk grows intentionally under the current paradigm of nuclear deterrence and that the pendulum swings from never <laughs> to always and, uh, and, and that message is signaled to the other side and as part of that pendulum swing, the safeguards on the nuclear forces begin to be shed. Now, last time we brandished nukes wholesale for this purpose was in 1973 during that Yom Kippur War when Kissinger and team raised the nuclear alert level uh, in order to warn Soviet leaders that they had better back down. So the, the, I won't go into the background of this, but better back down or else face uh, the escalating risk of nuclear war, driven not so much <coughs> by premeditation as by inadvertence. Now, I, you know, I don't want to sound al alarmist, and I know Hans is going to slap me if I if I go too far here, but I, I do want to uh, I do want to sound a little bit alarm here about the current situation, in especially the Ukraine, where Russia's soundings of nuclear uh, warnings for this imbroglio I think is very reminiscent of the sort of Cold War brinksmanship. At least, it, 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 you know, the crisis is far from matching the. Cold War tensions, but there are risk takers in this game. I think Putin is a risk taker. And we're witnessing the early stages of a spiral of action reaction cycles along with dangerous unintended consequences. So we're seeing um, that NATO fighter planes and, uh, are making hundreds of intercepts of Russian warplanes, which are stepping up their provocative overflights of foreign airspace. <coughs> and the Russian fighters are exercising very muscular interdiction against uh, NATO. It wasn't, uh, I think it was about a year ago, Hans, when a U.S. spy playing RC-135, and by the way, in a crisis, reconnaissance gets just ramped up to the hilt, and a lot of aircraft uh, flying around borders and things like that. Um, the, the, the Russians um, harassed the U.S. spy plane to the extent that it had to flee in the Swedish airspace in order to get away. Now, at some point in the crisis, I think these interactions begin to multiply and cascade and spin out of control. And I think it can happen even today. And as I said, we're beginning to see a glimmer of this. Um, you know, in order to reassure, reassure, you know, in response to sort of the Russian provocations uh, in Ukraine, we've moved to reassure our NATO allies in Eastern Europe. And in doing that, we've been flying U.S. strategic bombers to the region, sometimes in, <coughs> sometimes in provocative formations. And again, the Russians have responded to counter with uh, actions that have involved nuclear-capable missiles. This, is, this begins to happen across the board, and it's impossible for 
anyone at the top to manage this. It becomes, it, it becomes a highly decentralized process. And here's another example of what's going on. We began uh, deploying Aegis destroyers in the Black Sea in response to this problem to reassure, reassure our allies like Romania that we're there for them. And as it turns out, these uh, destroyers carry substantial numbers of cruise missiles armed with conventional warheads uh, with a range of 1,000 miles, which means that from the Black Sea they could hit Moscow. They could actually, dis they could actually destroy the Kremlin uh, virtually without warning. Um, but uh, by my calculations, they can destroy virtually any target within range except for the most hard of, 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 of targets, those in the sort of 1,000 pounds per square inch blast over pressure range. Moreover, the Russians can't be absolutely 100% certain that these cruise missiles on the shores of the Black Sea don't carry <coughs> weapons. So on paper, on paper, the general staff could, can and probably is arguing that the United States has suddenly uh, deployed a decap decapitation threat. And I think that may well be what's underlying the recent Russian move to deploy a fleet of attack submarines to the Black Sea to, to, deal, with, um, to deal with these destroyers, although they already have been flying their warplanes um, in, in, uh, uh, against those destroyers to harass them. And in a further um, cycle of escalation here, the NATO top commander has proposed deploying U.S. anti-submarine aircraft to new bases in this region to counter the Russian subs, which are being deployed, which now threaten our destroyers, our destroyers which now threaten Moscow. So at some point um, in this game, one side or the other may blink, may back off, or maybe not. Maybe the tensions continue to rise until it escape, escalates to the level of the thresh, threshold of the use of nuclear weapons. In the case of Russia, which uh, adopted a first-use policy in 1993, this threshold is very low. Its strategy in Europe was devised by President Putin himself in 2000 in response to the uh, U.S. NATO bombing of the Balkans. It's called, the strategy is called uh, escalatory de-escalation, which call, calls for the use of tens to even hundreds of nuclear weapons in a first strike meant to shock an adversary into paralysis. And so it might. Uh, uh, or it just might escalate into a nuclear exchange. Needless to say, there are even stronger escalatory updrafts in other parts of the world, and I, uh, uh, India and Pakistan being uh, a really good example of this. I'll, I'm running uh, a little over here, but I'm almost finished. And I want to wind down by making a few, uh, uh, a few conclusions and then ticking off a few recommendations. Number one, the Cold War, in my view, was uh, far more fraught with, with risk and unstable than the paradigm of mutual deterrence claimed it to be. Two, nuclear weapons largely escaped the control of the democratic process in the United States. Three, although some major risks have subsided in the case of the original five nuclear powers, other major risks persist, including <coughs> problems of launch on false alarm, cyber threats, and the slippery and steep slope of crisis escalation. Four, the newest members of the nuclear club are running a multitude of growing risks, and Pakistan in particular is a nuclear explosion waiting to happen. And five, given all this risk taking, given that deterrence itself is nothing more or less than the manipulation of nuclear risk, I think we cannot reasonably expect nuclear weapons never to be used. I think we are closer to always than to never, and we can reasonably expect nuclear weapons uh, to be used in our lifetime, somewhere in the world. So, um, the solution is to get rid of them all. Amen. Total zero. Amen. Uh, but that's not going to happen overnight. And in the meantime, we need a few ideas, measures that can help mitigate some of the risks that I outlined. And so I have seven of them. I'll just this will take two minutes. I'll be done. Uh, number one, the United States and Russia could agree to eliminate launch on warning from the strategy. And I think they should. 
and they should immediately cease conducting exercises that involve launching nuclear forces solely on the basis of data from early warning sensors. Two, they could begin to agree, um, or sorry, begin to, to take their strategic forces off of here trigger alert by adopting physical measures like downloading the, the warheads to storage that would extend the time needed to launch them from the current period of seconds and minutes to a period of, say, days. Uh, that was a recommendation. These, both, all of these recommendations, by the way, were endorsed by General Cartwright, one of the recent commanders of the strategic forces, and many other senior uh, generals from around the world um, that participated in this report that Frank mentioned at the outset. <coughs> So uh, we recommended that beginning with an immediate 20% reduction in the size of their missile forces on high alert, that uh, the US and Russia verifiably stand down all of, those, all of their forces on high alert in phases over the next 10 years. Three, all of the nuclear weapons countries could agree to refrain from putting nuclear forces on high alert under tight, uh, except under tightly controlled conditions. We get them off alert in peacetime. If, for reasons of exercises or training or, or national emergencies, there is a, a national security requirement to put nuclear weapons on, on alert, then uh, there, that process should be regulated. The scope, the timing should be regulated and should require pre-notification of reload. Four. <coughs> The U.S. and Russia could work with other nuclear establishments to share uh, knowledge, best practices, and technologies in the area of safety and security, and we have done this to some extent, even, even with countries outside the NPT, like Pakistan. It's a, it's a tricky business legally and politically, but um, it's possible. We could do a lot more. Five, the U.S. and Russia could lead an effort, uh, maybe with China, to ban cyber warfare aimed at nuclear command control communications and early warning networks. They should be off limits to cyber attacks. Six, nuclear safeguards could be designed on the assumption of insider collusion involving two or more people working with outsiders, replacing the current uh, prevailing threat model used in the United States and other countries, uh, that a model that assumes only a single insider working with outsiders. We should tighten up uh, this model that we use to, 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 to design our nuclear safeguards. And lastly, um, we, should be, we should be cooking up a lot more confidence building measures, probably through military to military dialogue that could help reduce this, um, the risk of that the current geopolitical tensions around the world could escalate by design or inadvertence to the nuclear threshold. And we have quite a few of them in, the, in, that, uh, in that report. But I defer to my brilliant um, international relations colleagues uh, at the Wilson Center for deep, Deeper Solutions to these deep structural uh, security problems around the world. So Gary and John, I invite two of you to, to weigh in on this. So thank you. Uh, that's, that's all I have to uh, say. If uh, God forbid the U.S. launches a missile accidentally, sorry. If God forbid the U.S. launches a missile accidentally and destroys the Russian city, what proportion of the Russian strike force will be taken out? And would they have still sufficient firepower to destroy all? Um, I've never seen any scenario where the launch of even a single missile at Russia or vice versa. Um, would readily end with with that single launch. It, it, the, it, it would escalate almost certainly. Be very difficult to not to. And the, given that the two sides have 5,000 nuclear weapons in their respective arsenals, with roughly 850, 800 of the strategic high yield nuclear weapons on launch ready alert at all times. Um, there's, you know, one missile launch by accident would have no impact on the sort of the strategic balance on, on firepower of, of available to, to either side. The question 
really becomes, you know, how do you, how would you manage that that kind of crisis? Um, so one mistake will not cause Armageddon. Hmm? One mistake will not cause Armageddon. Uh, not if it not if it didn't escalate beyond a single missile. But as I said, it's a very difficult proposition to control. Uh, control the operational interactions between two countries that have just used a nuclear weapon against, against one or the other. Chris. Bruce, your, a lot of your anecdotes were, were uh, startling or mm -hmm. deeply unnerving, mm -hmm. but the nature of your talk didn't give you the time to give us a sense of the evidence for the various anecdotes and how strong the evidence is. Let me just ask for one, um, one of the most startling, the, your statement that during the Cold War, uh, the civilians, civilians were not allowed to see the plans inside of the president's football. Um, what's the evidence for that, and what's your assessment of the quality of that evidence? Um, in, in that particular case, the evidence comes from a man who graduated from the Woodrow Wilson School, mm -hmm. and who has published a, an account of his experience on the inside, uh, attempting to achieve that very aim of having access, having civilians get access to the nuclear football, which was finally um, finally accomplished at the end of the Cold War when this individual, you all, I think many of you know him, um, Frank, Miller. Frank Miller, was able to persuade Casper Weinberger, the Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, to force the issue. And uh, so, um, Frank Miller has written this up, and it's uh, going to be appearing in a forthcoming publication. Of it. I have a feeling that it may be undergoing some class classification review. Um, but um, and, uh, the fact that it was published with the blessing and approval and, and uh, also corroboration of a four-star general in the Strategic Air Command uh, gives me confidence that this is a credible I have, I have, uh, there's, there's nothing that I said that doesn't have this very strong basis in, in the empirical record or in my personal experience. So in, um, in some cases there would be individuals, particularly in the Air Force, who would say, uh, you know, Blair's not explaining it exactly right. Um, I'm happy to debate anyone who would assert that. But, um, you know, for example, I've made the point that before 1977, the unlock codes for launching Minuteman missiles were, were eight zeros. And the Air Force has challenged that for it, but it's, I promise you, I'm, I'm, I'm lying to this in the wrong. How? Uh, your list of seven groups, you didn't mention no first use, which I would have thought would be uh, another kind of simple but important initiative. Well, yeah, I only gave, gave seven. I, I, you know, I'm not sure that uh, it would necessarily have. Uh, you know, for, you did, we did what I proposed doing. I think no first use is pretty, pretty close to implicit in that. Furthermore, that's. Um, I think we're going to get to no first use. The, the uh, nuclear employment uh, posture um, review under, done, undertaken by Obama brought us that close to no first use. And we were, we're calling a sole purpose policy. And the sole purpose of nuclear weapons is just to deter an attack against us, which, which implies no first use. And Obama was that close to signing that until uh, a, a, another uh, person, whose name I won't mention, talked him out, out of it at a sort of penultimate meeting at the National Security Conference when they were reviewing the, the final document on the grounds that we might have to use nuclear weapons to uh, deal with a uh, problem of a terrorist threat of uh, biological attack against the United States. It's a long, <coughs> long story, but that was the gist of the reason why we didn't actually get to the President Obama endorsing uh, a sole purpose for nuclear forces. So let's go back here. Um, yes. A year or so, we've seen um, calls by some American commentators like Matt Kronig and Elbridge Colby to adopt a more so-called like tailored nuclear posture um, that might involve more emphasis on non-strategic weapons or, or deploying nuclear weapons, um, so-called limited nuclear use. I'm wondering if you can talk about 
what kind of challenges that doctrine might pose from a pain and control perspective, and how that would sort of intersect with some of the issues you talked about today. Well, I think it's an attempt to make nuclear weapons more usable, which we don't need because we are the juggernaut in our conventional strength. You know, we simply don't need nuclear weapons. And in fact, uh, some work that I'm currently doing here uh, at, at, at Princeton shows how thoroughly we are, are managing to substitute conventional weapons for nuclear weapons. So we, we don't need to go down to mini nukes. We can jump all the way to conventional weapons to perform almost all of the all the plausible missions that we we might have to per, per, perform in, in, in the future. Um, so yeah, I would uh, I, I think it's non I think it's really nonsense. Zia. Well, Bruce, looking at your seven things that we need to do, if you had to turn it into a research agenda, what would it look like for people who are here and elsewhere? Um, well, I think that we, we would lay out in uh, more detail the, the underlying risks, which I highlighted here, and then, um, and then lay out, as we started to do in this report, signed off by the Cartwright and Company, lay out a, a group, a set of options on how, for example, one would stand down our forces to take them off alert, and that report has about 25 examples of how the United States and Russia could do that, from taking warheads off to, um, to removing other critical components <coughs> from the missiles besides the warheads. For example, a submarine goes to sea, you could take off its guidance set and just uh, uh, leave, leave, it, um, leave it in the submarine but not made it up to the, to the missile. There are a whole range of things that are interesting. What gets dicey and uh, challenging from the standpoint of research Basically, there are two, are two issues. One um, is how important is verification? And if you're just standing down in the beginning a you know, small percentage of your force, like 20%, I would argue verification is not problematic. But if you're standing down 100%, then it's, it's much more important. Um, how do you verify that those very things? And secondly, uh, and this is sort of the bugaboo within the Pentagon, the reason they push back on me on this agenda of the alerting, is um, how can you prove that if we did under did begin a re-alerting process in a national emergency during a crisis, that 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 process would be stable enough that it would not uh, result in you know, first strike incentives? And so th that's a very interesting and challenging uh, set of set of, uh, of research undertakings. Yeah. And then uh, I think. I miss you, Rob. You were next. So. Uh, okay. So you've given us lots of material to have nightmares over. I wonder if you have a lot of nightmares. But secondly, the paradigm of people actually worrying about nuclear weapons and it rising to the top of their priority list in terms of the political power that's needed to kind of, you know, address these things. I've seen it on nuclear terrorism, that danger. Uh, but not on much else having to do with nuclear weapons. So do you have any comment on that as to how sort of... I don't know how to do that. We you don't know how to do that. I think we have to have a youth movement, largely, that um, at a Global Zero we are building one that's increasingly important and effective. That works, um, that works in the democracies when you can have right. grassroots support for changes in policies. It doesn't work in countries like like China, where there's no such thing as lobbying for changes in security policy from the grassroots. And so you have to have a tailored strategy in all the countries. If you want to get to zero, you have to have nine countries engaged in the process, and multilateral dialogue and negotiations for phased reductions down to zero. And uh, so it's a very complex strategy that we have um, organized at Global Zero that's tailored to each, each of the countries. But in the United States and the democracies, the key is to um, mobilize the people. And as you say, it's hard to do, but that's, I think that's... Uh, do you have a lot of nightmares yourself? Um, I, you know, I, I have dreams about <laughs> these things. <laughs> good, good and bad, yeah. Uh, and then, I missed, oh, uh, okay, so, yes. On that, on that note, I think this is a
very disciplined process. <laughs> things have to end at one o'clock, but if, if people want to, uh, they would uh, discuss with Bruce afterwards. You'll be here for a while. Thanks for inviting.